I'm the mayor of Washington, D.C. I'm providing an update to district residents on the district's response to COVID-19. Uh, and um, I am joined today by Deputy Mayor John Falchicchio, who's the Deputy Mayor for Planning and Economic Development. Uh, Christina Grant, uh, Dr. Christina Grant, who's the Superintendent for Education for the District of Columbia, uh, as well as Patrick Ashley, who is the Deputy Director uh, at D.C. Health. Uh, let's start um, by providing a quick update on the district's um, experience with COVID. These are uh, data that we provide on a daily basis at coronavirus.dc.gov. Uh, Uh, key metrics uh, here um, are the weekly case rate is 1,506.4 uh, per 100,000 for COVID-19 patients, uh, the most recent reported number. Uh, we're still seeing 5.2 percent. We're still seeing 5.2 percent of individuals hospitalized, and we have 83 percent of our hospital capacity uh, currently occupied. We can go to the next slide. Uh, we also are today announcing that uh, beginning today, uh, you can pick up COVID-19 uh, rapid antigen tests at six senior wellness centers uh, located throughout the community. And these are open for individuals that are 65 and older uh, at the, the senior centers. Uh, you'll note on the screen, uh, there are some that are open Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and others that are open Tuesday, Thursday. Uh, and just as a reminder, uh, all individuals 65 or older or who have disabilities are prioritized at any of our COVID-19 uh, testing sites uh, or vaccination sites throughout the community. Uh, thank you, Patrick. Um, and we are, we just want to encourage everybody to make uh, use of those sites, especially our seniors. Uh, so that they can have those tests on hand for themselves and their families. Uh, so let uh, me now turn to some updates on um, school testing, and I'll turn to Dr. Grant. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, good morning. Uh, first, want to step back and just send a tremendous uh, note of thank you to our families, our students, our staff, who have been with us along this journey of... I'm going to pull your mic up. Thank you. Who have been with us along this journey of keeping our schools open and keeping our children safe. I want to take a couple of minutes this morning to walk you through four aspects of our testing program, provide you with updates on what we have done and will continue to do, and then walk through some updates that I know individuals have been requesting. We've worked really hard to prioritize having our schools safe to return for in-person learning, and we're continuously using our health evidence and our science and our safety tools as we build the arsenal of our tools and our tools kit to keep our classrooms open and safe. We do have one of the most robust and comprehensive testing programs. And again, I'm excited to share with you where we are and where we hope to continue to go. Next slide, please. For the remainder of the 2021-22 school year, schools will continue to have symptomatic testing and asymptomatic testing um, to 20%. We now have the ability to test up to 30% across all of our schools in our stand up OSI, in our OSI stand up testing program, um, and that will continue. And it will, it has launched as of last week, it will continue to launch in the, in the moving forward. That data is collected on a weekly basis and will continue to be made available on Wednesday. Uh, from our organization. Next slide. Uh, again, thank you to everyone who participated in our test to return program as we came from our December break. We want to announce and confirm today that for the remainder of the school year, we will continue to distribute rapid antigen tests to all DCPS and public charter schools to be used before returning from any break. That is at least a full week of school. And so we will stand up the same test to return program at the end of February break. I want to uh, announce again today that we will now be making weekly rapid tests available for all staff and pre-K and K students on a weekly basis. Uh, we will be making those tests available by Friday of each week, and they'll be administered by families and staff before returning to school on Monday. This program will continue through this latest surge in cases, um, and I want to be clear that DCPS will be issuing guidance on that program this week, along with public charter schools. But we wanted to be clear that we had heard feedback that our littles 
Uh, we're still, you know, not quite being able to leverage the saliva-based testing, and so we want to make those readily available on a weekly basis starting this Friday. Many have asked and inquired about test to stay. Wanted to assure you all that we are in the planning phases of our program. We will be launching the test to stay model in the coming weeks. It is supported by OSI, it's supported by DC Health, and it's also based on the guidance that has come out of the CDC. Our test to stay program will allow students who have identified as close contacts who are not fully vaccinated the ability to take a series of rapid COVID-19 tests during their isolation period. If these tests return negative, the student can remain in school for in-person learning. I want to be crystal clear that it's critically important for families and students who have access to the vaccine to take the vaccine. That is the critical way to ensure children can remain in school, uh, and we look forward to sharing with you all an update on when the Test to Stay program will launch across our schools in the district. Those are all of my updates right now, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Grant. Uh, let me just move to a couple of reminders as we um, have discussed here for several uh, weeks. Uh, the vaccine requirement for certain indoor venues goes into effect this Saturday, January 15th at 6 a.m. Uh, so this is a reminder to D.C. residents, our guests, visitors, workers, uh, a mask uh, will be uh, required, proof of vaccine, vaccination, and your ID. So keep that in mind for going out um, beginning January 15th. That's this Saturday at 6 a.m. Uh, Deputy Mayor Falchicchio and his team uh, will also host a community town hall uh, for business owners or whoever would like to participate uh, tomorrow at 4 p.m. Uh, and you can dial in and follow our social media um, for that information. And uh, finally, I just want to remind everybody about getting vaccinated and boosted. Uh, we uh, continue to have pop-up sites that the district supports. There are also ways for you to get vaccinated at home for your entire family. Contact your provider, go to uh, a local pharmacy. All of those places will allow you to have your full course of vaccine, including a booster. This is also a reminder that children 5 to 11 years old are eligible, uh, and we still need more of our children uh, to get fully vaccinated. Uh, so with that, we have some time for questions. Mark. Good morning. Good morning. So if I could ask uh, one about the seniors uh, pickup, is that limited to two per day DC residents, just like the other rapid test? Um, yes. And then can you tell us why you're targeting, I guess I'll ask the, I'll group them together. It seems like you're targeting the pre-K kids with rapid tests and the seniors, making them a, more readily available than to the rest of us. What, what, why is that? Um, our pre-K kids are, are unvaccinated in our schools. Um, they're not eligible for vaccination. Uh, and uh, we are targeting uh, them, uh, as you note, um, with, with weekly tests. Um, for seniors, this is an additional way for our seniors to get access to rapid tests. They are, can, of course, go to any of the library locations where we distribute them. Um, but this is another way for us to prioritize senior distribution by going to wellness centers that they're very familiar with going to. Yes, Sam. Um, question for, uh, for uh, Mr. Ashley. Um, the hospitals, uh, it seems to me 85% or whatever you said, that doesn't seem to be that out of line. I mean, it doesn't seem to be a big deal. Is that, am I taking this right? You're not, I mean, it's not high, higher than normal. You know, hospital capacity, 83% uh, as of yesterday. Uh, so when we talk about overall capacity, certainly not high. Um, the concern that we've talked about here uh, is that, you know, we're seeing a lot of patients that are presenting to the ER that are not reflected in that capacity number. We're also seeing, <clears throat> excuse me, the staff uh, of the hospitals being affected by COVID-19 in the same way that we're seeing the community is. And so uh, you can have as many beds in the world that you want, but unless you have staff to staff them, 
uh, you can't, they're, they're not useful. So uh, we're working very closely with the hospitals to make sure that they have the resources that they need. And here in DC, is there any indication that this Omicron uh, variant is subsiding? So we are, we are seeing better numbers on our uh, weekly and daily case counts. Uh, and so we're very hopeful based on that data uh, that we are getting to a better spot. Uh, it's still certainly high. Um, it's still an area for concern and we don't expect that to go down overnight. Um, but we're, we're optimistic about some of the data that we've seen over the past seven days or so. So the well, last time we were here it was like over 2,000, wasn't it? Correct. And so now it's 1,500. Correct. So that is something. Correct. <laughs> yep. It is. It's still high, right? And that's, a lot. and that's why we want to be optimistic about it. But there's still a lot of COVID in the community. And so even though the numbers are better, it still presents a lot of risk to the community. Uh, and again, just to reiterate the mayor, the people that we're seeing that are most affected in the hospitals are the people that are unvaccinated. And so while we're seeing the 1500 individuals, that 1500 daily case or weekly case rate, it's the people that are unvaccinated that are ending up in the hospital, in the ICU and dying. Yes, sir. A uh, question about the uh, new test to return uh, program, I guess, just looking for some more clarification. It's uh, students are required to get uh, have a negative COVID test before they return after all, is it week long, planned week long breaks from school? What if they're out for, you know, an unplanned break unrelated to COVID? Is it that the same rules apply? I'm not sure I follow you. You mean if they're out for some un other reason? Right. Um, I, I don't think that these programs address that, um, but I'll let Dr. Grant refer to that. That is correct. That. From the framing of your question, if a student was mis dismissed school on their own, we would encourage families to leverage tests available throughout the district to test their students and send them back with the best data that they had. Okay. A student would return to school and participate in the surveillance testing program that we have in place. Okay. This is specifically for when we have been separated from our children due to breaks in the calendar, the break we just had, February break, and if still necessitated, spring break. Got it, okay. And uh, in regard to the uh, um, vaccine mandate for public indoor venues, uh, which goes into effect, I believe, Friday or Saturday. Is there Saturday? Saturday thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, is there any uh, consideration or thought of requiring employees to also be vaccinated? Um, we we have certainly discussed that, but we include that in our support for the uh, employer mandates um, that the Biden administration continues to push. Okay. Yes. I have a question specifically. Are you considering renewing the public health emergency as DC hospitals have recommended? Um, we are certainly looking um, to see what we think is necessary. Uh, you've heard uh, Patrick already discuss um, the continued concerns that we have re regarding staffing um, that the hospitals have uh, in the emergency rooms that we're concerned about bottlenecks around. Uh, at the same time, we're concerned about making sure um, patients have protection. So um, we are l looking very closely at that. It is very likely that there's some administrative things that we have to do um, to make sure that hospitals can operate nimbly. But that's, um, we're still evaluating that request. And then furthermore, for kind of the um, January 15th sort of indoor venue requirement, um, are public libraries exempt from the vaccine um, card requirement that begins then? Can you repeat your question? Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, are public libraries exempt from the vaccine card requirement that begins on January 15th? Um, they would be, uh, their special events would not be exempt. So if they are having a gathering using um, their auditorium, or um, some types of reception. Some of the libraries have those types of rooms that are available for rent and they would, um, the vaccine requirement would apply. And then this is a question for you, Mr. Ashley. Um, does DC Health have a way of deduplicating data? So say like a person takes a rapid and PCR test. Can you kind of, are you able to silo that a little bit or would it show up twice? Sure, it's a, it's a great question. So certainly, yes, we have the ability to do deduplication. It's something we do uh, every day. Um, and we do not, uh, the, the, the results that are reported in the coronavirus.dc.gov slash over the counter are not necessarily included in our daily case rates. Uh, and so we do some deduplication of all of our data, but those are two separate data sets. 
And then one last question for you. If a te person tests positive on a rapid test, do you, is it your current guidance that you recommend that they take a PCR test to confirm the diagnosis? It's a great question. Uh, we do not recommend that currently. Uh, so we treat antigen test as presumptively positive. Uh, and so there's no need to uh, use a PCR test unless they need it for, for other purposes. We'd rather preserve those resources for individuals that are testing through PCR that may not be utilizing our antigen program. And so we've talked a lot about balancing resources in the community. Uh, and so that's just taking up another resource that isn't necessary. Uh, you should treat that as positive uh, and go home and isolate. No further questions. Mark? Uh, if I could follow up on that, uh, Patrick. So why then are you not, if, if, if we were to consider a rapid test the same as a, as a PCR test and act just the same as presumed positive, why aren't those numbers being included in the daily case rates? Sure, it's a great question. Uh, it really has to do with data integrity, Mark. Um, we, you know, we take self-reported data uh, for uh, the over-the-counter. We have no way of validating that data. Uh, we don't know uh, if individuals have submitted that, you know, using their full name. We have a higher degree of confidence in laboratory reported data. Uh, and we had this conversation early on in the pandemic, uh, April, uh, I believe April of 2020, about uh, many other states were reporting probable, case and probable cases or suspect cases. Uh, DC has always led the country in our lab reported data. We've made PCRs available since the very beginning. And so we, we take a lot of you know, pride in making sure that we're using accurate data that's reflective of what's going on in the community. We don't have that necessarily confidence in self-reported data. I appreciate that. And then for the schools, could I just get a clarification uh, for these two breaks, the February break and the spring break, will that look just like it did um, after the winter break that there would be two day, and is it teacher, is it staff and students? And then would it look the same way? There would be two days set up where staff would go in and pick up their tests, students would pick up their tests, everybody would upload on the same day. And are you gonna close for that like you did before? Would you do that? That is such a great question. Uh, so we've learned a lot from what we experienced. Uh, we will stand up the program uh, in a very similar to what families just experienced, but we will not be closing schools for instructional days to operationalize it. Uh, in partnership and collaboration with DC Health, we will make sure that we have the test available before the end of the, the school week. So the Friday before the break, we will make sure that children have access to kits to take home with them. And then DCPS and public charter schools will issue guidance to families on which day they should test to return. Most likely it will be the Sunday before schools reopen. We then will have those families upload those results very similar to what took place. But we've learned a lot from what we did last week, uh, and we will not be using instructional days to stand up the program moving forward. And then Mayor Bowser, uh, could I ask about Dr. Nesbitt? We have not seen her, I think it may be going on the fourth week, at least the third week that we have not seen her in the midst of this surge that is being described as, you know, the biggest surge that the hospitals have seen since the pandemic began. Can you just give us any sure, update without crossing any lines? Sure, she would be thrilled to line? know how much you miss her. I appreciate it. Um, and Dr. Nesbitt's on leave, and we'll, we'll look forward to her return this month. Can I just follow up on sure. that? And again, without trying to cross any lines, but is she on medical leave, personally? She's is, not. She is on a planned leave. Um, and I think that we can all look back over the last 20 months and imagine how much leave she has accumulated. Um, and the hours that she's worked. So she had a planned winter um, leave. I appreciate that. Thank you. Bet. you. Yes. Um, are DC hospitals tracking um, COVID cases, like the people who go to the hospital because they're showing COVID symptoms versus people who go to the hospital for other issues and then test positive for COVID? And is that being reported to DC Health? It's a, it's a great question. They are tracking that. Uh, so you have primary diagnosis of why you're in the hospital. Uh, they do provide that to us. We also see in hospitals, there's COVID in the community. And so uh, you may be going in the hospital for uh, you know, a broken leg or some other, uh, some other ailment. Uh, those individuals come from the community. And so we see some of that same community COVID that's coming into the hospitals. Uh, and we're working to make that, avail that data available uh, so that we have some better insight or better data to the public to show who is in the hospital for COVID specifically and then who's incidentally COVID positive. Okay. And I have a couple of questions for Dr. Grant. Um, for the test to stay program, you said that that will be implemented in the coming weeks. Do you have a more specific timeline 
for when that might be? Can we say February or earlier? Uh, we will all right. do not like saying definitely, mm -hmm. but uh, it is highly likely that we will announce the logistics of the program before February. Uh, we are still stepping back to make sure we are in alliance with the CDC guidelines, making sure we work through the logistics with our schools uh, to ensure that they are able to operationalize it with fidelity. And so I, I will say within the coming weeks and definitely before February. Okay. If, if I could just emphasize um, about um, test to stay and the more children who are fully vaccinated, the less um, need there is to even be concerned about test to stay. Uh, test to stay really applies to those children who may be exposed to a positive case, a positive classmate um, in particular, uh, and aren't vaccinated. But if they're vaccinated, test to stay doesn't even come into play. So it's so, so important um, that parents and children are making the choice to get their kids fully vaccinated because that is one way that they can contribute um, to having to not having disruptions to um, their children's learning experience yes um, there's no Martin Luther King parade this year um, and um, but there is a peace walk and I was just uh, curious are you going to be participating in that or have you dealt with it yet and I understand that the focus is going to be uh, on voting rights um, I um, I don't know that I have um, confirmed what I will be doing that day Sam but, but I'll the keep week from posted. today that's why I was yeah. Just, yeah thank you thank you for the reminder I don't I don't have it um, scheduled yet okay yes uh, on the, uh, the 15th and the vaccine mandate when it comes to, to gyms I think we're pretty clear for gyms memberships places where people go what about gymnasiums that are in an office building or are in an apartment building uh, that are only used by the residents of that building or the employees of that office building? Are they still required to be vaccinated to use those gyms in those buildings? Um, Mark, um, can I ask uh, John if you would follow up with Mark and team? Unless do you, do you have yeah. that? Yeah, yeah. so we're, uh, we're uh, updating the guidance now to make it more clear. Uh, that those would not be included uh, because it's a set finite group of people uh, that would have access to them. So they would not, so the so private gyms and buildings would be excluded? A private gym that is uh, only for the residents? For the residents would, Correct, be, yeah. would be excluded. I appreciate Correct. that. And then Mayor Bowers, if I could ask just two off-topic questions about uh, staffing, both yep. Department of Corrections, there's been a change, and then uh, DPW, your nominee there. Could you address those two changes there um sure um so I, th I think we announced on on friday that our former director uh who will will be coming back to um lead uh, the dc corrections which is operates the dc jail and your second question DPW, your nominee there? Um, our nominee uh, there, uh, Christina Davis, who is just an outstanding employee for us uh, and has been at DPW. I, I think she has served a number of um, a number of directors. She will not proceed in the nominations process, and we will continue to look for DPW leadership. I guess on both of these, the question I'm looking for is why? You know, why, why make the change at DOC? Why withdraw the DPW nominee? Um, we, we feel um, very, um, COVID has been, um, has presented a, a number of issues for the DC jail. Uh, our partners uh, with the jail um, for sure have um, worked with us and they're going to continue to work with us and I felt uh, right now especially now given the challenges that we've experienced with COVID that a a, a, um, a change at the jail would would help advance all of our relationships and the experience for people um, who are with us at DC jail and DPW um, and at DPW, uh, we we had to win confirmation for Ms. Davis, and I was concerned about that. Uh, I would never typically make a change at DPW during the winter season. 
and so that that's that's t a tough situation for us but it's also important um, that all of our stakeholders and partners have confidence um, in in leadership at DPW thank you yes um, and then I'll come to you. I know you've been um, waiting. Yes. Yeah, I had a quick question about the last round sort of of test to return. Um, there were some schools in particular that had more kind of cases submitted from students and enrollment um, figures. Were you aware of those kind of issues that pump, like came up and do you have kind of an explanation for those discrepancies? Your question again? Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, with the last round with kind of test results submitted, in some cases there were more test results submitted than enrollment figures at the school, like for, with students per se or with staff members. Um, is there kind of an, you know, were you aware of those issues? Um, do you kind of have an explanation for those discrepancies? No, I'd have to follow up with you. It's the first time I'm hearing of that type of discrepancy. I know that we made tests available to all children regardless of what specific school they attended, but would need to hear more from you about the reporting back. That's the first I'm hearing of that discrepancy. Hi, thanks. Uh, just one quick um, first. For the vaccine uh, mandate, is a picture of the vaccine card enough proof or do they need the physical card to enter a location? Okay. And um, in terms of staffing levels for DC government, we're seeing, you know, people all over the region having to quarantine or fall sick. Um, what are the staffing levels of key agencies like DPW or fire department, uh, you know, MPD? Are there numbers on how many people are quarantined? Um, yes, I can get you the specific numbers. We track it. We usually take a survey of our employees once a week to know um, the report. And while I don't have the number off the top of my head, I got a very, um, I got good news today is that our numbers this week are far less, you know, we don't see the exponential growth that we had seen for about two or three weeks. Um, but those numbers are coming down among our employees as well. When did it sort of start rising? Like, could you speak a bit about this survey, um, the trend line in general? Um, I don't have it in front of me, but I'm happy to have somebody follow up with you. Okay. Yes. Um, are you publishing um, vaccination rates by school? And if so, when would that be available? No, we do not plan on publishing that. Okay, and I've heard anecdotally on Thursday that attendance was down in some schools. Do you have what the attendance rate was across the city for Thursday? Do you know attendance for Thursday, Dr. Grant? We are working on collecting the data. As you all know, we had a snow day on Friday and students are returning today. We hope to have that data available by tomorrow. Okay, and then I have a question about the $17 million and federal money that the city received for rent relief. Um, how is that money going to be used? Will you reopen the stay DC portal or will that be used to pay out existing uh, applications? Yeah, so uh, when we closed out uh, the portal back in November, uh, we had more uh, applications than we had funding for. Uh, so this $17 million allotment, which we're grateful to President Biden and the Treasury uh, for making available, uh, will be used to satisfy that demand. Um, and then uh, one other thing that we're optimistic about is there's another opportunity at reallocation, uh, which uh, is due to be filed uh, later this month. Uh, so we'll make another request for reallocation, uh, which will help us uh, bolster pre-pandemic programs, which we're seeing a lot of uh, demand for uh, right now. Okay, and uh, Mayor Bowser, do you mind sort of elaborating a little bit more about why you made the staffing changes at the DC jail? Um, why specifically you decided to make those changes? I mean, I don't have anything else to say. I already answered that question. Um, many people, maybe perhaps you aren't familiar with Tom Faust and uh, his leadership of DPW, I'm sorry, of DC um, Corrections. Uh, he actually moved um, and that's why he left government in the first place. And uh, we're just thrilled that he's interested in coming back to the right coast uh, and to DC Corrections. How many probable cases were included in Friday's total case count of, I believe it was 144,593. Do you have a sense of that? I don't have it in front of me, but all of it's posted on coronavirus.dc.gov data. Thank you. Um, yep. 
DC substitute teachers want more pay. Have you heard about this? Um, do you have a response? And how? Well, you know, I have heard about it, but I have to say it wasn't an issue um, that's come come to me before this week. And we're gonna we're gonna dig into it. Our substitutes are a very important part uh, of our team. Um, and uh, I know for speaking for DC public schools, we are we have a real focus on substitutes who want to be long term substitutes and are regular um, substitutes and make sure that we're paying accordingly. Thank you. You bet. All right. Thank you, everybody.